Hmm, what is space medicine? Well, it's the same as normal medicine. It's just a lot slower. Hilarious. What is it really? Well, it's keeping astronauts healthy. And you do that in three ways. One, you keep them healthy before they go. That's optimization. Two, you try to keep them healthy when they're up there. And three, you've got to sort them out when they come back. And you really do need to sort them out because space messes you up. So let me tell you all about space medicine uh, for beginners. The major issue for the human body in space is zero gravity and the effects it has on all of your body systems. Oh, and before you write in the comments, I don't really mean zero gravity, I mean microgravity. That's like 90% of the Earth's gravity is your orbiting the Earth, but you're in free fall, so it feels like zero gravity, so that's what we're gonna call it. Okay, it's like Bill and Ted in their bogus journey. So when you're in microgravity, you essentially have no load on your body. So your body starts adapting and it does some really crazy adapting, which we're gonna talk about. And just when you're feeling comfortable, you come back to earth and you're whacked with one G of full gravity again. And so your body has to readapt back to being on earth. It's a pretty good way to gaslight yourself. And when I say adapt, I really mean adapt. Your body is constantly changing. In fact, pretty much all your cells are always turning over to the extent that every few years or so, you're probably not you anymore. You're an entirely new you. So who are you? Yeah. Yeah, let that kick in for a bit. But don't worry, that's another video. The take home here is that cells change based on their environment and the pressures on them. Think about walking outside barefoot for a few days. The skin on your feet get harder because your body has adapted. They've adapted. In space, you don't have gravity and you don't have a ton of air on you. So you adapt and that causes some issues. So let me take you through, you know, some of them. Let's start with fluid shift. Now, normally on Earth, the blood pools in your legs, but when you go into space, fluid starts to move out of your legs and can end up in your face. That's why astronauts tend to have what we call chicken legs and moon faces. And just from a few seconds of me being upside down, I can feel it beginning to happen to me. Whoa! In fact, you can see that my face is a little bit red now. So, what's actually going on here? Well, when fluid starts pooling up in the head, your blood pressure sensors, which are in your neck, start to think that you have a higher blood pressure than you actually do. That's why astronauts pee quite a lot in the first few weeks as your body's trying to get that blood pressure down, but your blood pressure isn't actually high. Eventually your body figures that out. However, when you come back down to Earth, you have the same problem, but in reverse. So astronauts can get lightheaded a lot easier than other people. And this is called orthostatic intolerance. It is a problem managing your fluid balance. And you might have actually seen this. For example, if you've seen an older person try to stand up, get a little bit wobbly and sit back down again before trying again, that's because those mechanisms aren't working so well anymore. And if you've ever had something like a hot bath or a hot jacuzzi, which opens up all the veins in your legs so the fluid pools down there, and then you stand up too fast, it can take a little while for the body to try and get that blood up to your brain. So you might get a bit dizzy as well. That's orthostatic intolerance, and that's what astronauts will feel for several weeks after they come back down to Earth. So your body balances in three main ways. The first way is with your eyes. You're looking and you're checking that everything's level. Let's take a look. So as you look at this nice view, your eyes are checking that the horizon is level. If you tilt one way or the other way, your brain knows that you're off balance, and so you adjust back to normal. The second thing is proprioception. That's how your body knows where your joints are as you move around. This relies on gravity, but in space you don't have that, so this sense becomes kind of useless. 
Now the third one is a bit complicated. It's your semicircular canals. Now you have three of them on either side of your head in your inner ear. And when you move your head, the fluid starts moving in those canals and tells your brain that your head is off balance so you can correct it. The problem is when you're in zero gravity, that fluid starts floating all over the place, which makes your brain think that your head is doing this when it probably isn't. Now, the major problem is when there is a mismatch between the inputs. So for example, if your eyes are telling you one thing and your semicircular canals are telling you something else. It's a little bit like when you get seasick. So when you're on a boat and in a cabin like this, for example, my inner ears are picking up the waves and they're feeling this, but my eyes are just seeing a cabin which isn't moving around at all. That mismatch makes me feel sick. So when you get seasick, the best thing to do is to go outside whoa, like this and then look around at the horizon because then your inner ears are picking up the waves, your eyes are seeing the waves, and everything just seems normal. And that's the way to do it. Now back to what I said earlier, bones are a great example of a part of you which is turning over all the time. You have gravity, air, walking, lifting. I mean, everything on earth is pushing into your bones, which makes your bones develop really strong. The best way to illustrate this as scientifically accurately as possible is with chocolate, because chocolate is exactly the same as bones. On earth, your bones look exactly like crunchies. Look. So this is your bone on earth. It's a crunchy and listen, oh, it sounds exactly like when your bones break. And look at that, it's really close knit, it's really tight in there, which makes it nice and strong. I can't press that down. That is what your bone looks like on earth. And this, mm, oh man, it's what your bone tastes like on earth. Now in space, your bones turn into something more like arrows. Still equally as delicious, but just not quite as packed as before. Let's have a look. So the arrow, if I break it, you can see inside, it's got this really loose structure. That's what the bones turn into in space because it doesn't have the load. So if you look closely, it's weak and I can break it and press it really, really easily. Having said that, oh my God, it still tastes amazing. So in space, your bones basically turn from this into this. Still equally as tasty, but it just doesn't have the strength. It's a bit like osteoporosis, which happens to people on earth as they get older, especially older women, because once you go through the menopause, you lose the hormone which helps your bones get strong. Now, none of this is really an issue at the moment when you go to space because you don't really need strong bones. In fact, we might see a future where people with really horrible inflammatory arthritis, people in constant pain in their joints, live out their life in space because they're completely unloaded. Basically a cure. But most people won't do that. Most people will wanna get off the bus, and go back to Earth or Mars, and you don't want your first experience to be your bone breaking. Oh. oh, hey, you caught me. So muscles, just like bones, your muscles are loaded all the time just by doing day-to-day -day stuff on Earth. I mean, if you've ever broken your leg, you'll know that your leg wastes away in the cast because it's not loaded. And then you need to try and build that muscle back up again when you're out the cast. Now in space, you're having that issue, but with all of your muscles and you can't even lift weights to fix the problem because there is no weight in space. <coughs> Broadly speaking, your muscles are split into two types, fast twitch and slow twitch. If you want to know the difference, tense your bicep as fast as you can. Go on, hold it, hold it. Now it gets tense pretty fast, right? But it's not super strong and it fatigues easily. Hence, I couldn't keep lifting that weight. Now, stand up and squeeze your ass together. Go on, squeeze it, squeeze, yes. It takes a few seconds for you to achieve maximum ass clench, right? But once you do, it's super strong. These are postural slow twitch muscles. Now in space, your slow twitch muscles turn into a weird, hybrid-y, fast, slow twitch muscle, which basically means your arm ends up in your ass, and that's not good for anyone. <sighs> Breathing is done by bones and muscles, so you'd think it'd be badly affected in space, wouldn't you? But it isn't, so let's move on. Your 
eyes. Some astronauts, especially the ones who had been up there for a long time, started to complain of some weird visual changes in their eyes. Now, after looking into it, we began to see that there are a few things going on, not just in the astronauts who have been up there for ages, but in some of the astronauts that haven't been up there for a very long time at all. If you look in their eyes, you can see things like disc edema, globe flattening, cotton wool spots, and a few other things too. Basically in space, this is your eye and this is what's happening to it. Now, what's really reassuring is that we don't know what causes this or how to do anything about it. Um. <sighs> on Earth, the sun rises every 24 hours. But in space, it rises every 90 minutes. That messes with your circadian rhythm, which is Latin, circa diem, about the day. Latin fact. Your rhythm essentially sets your body clock and your body actually runs on that clock like shift work in a factory. Certain organs and hormones clock in and clock out at different times of day. And if you mess with this, the factory still kind of works, it just doesn't work quite as well as it should. Ask anyone who does shift work and they'll tell you how rubbish they feel after doing a night shift. In fact, we now know that night shifts reduce your life expectancy. And that's happening to you in space all the time. Space makes you crazy. Just ask my buddies on the event horizon. If you don't have the right mindset, you're prone to depression, psychosis, and worse. And look, I haven't even spoken about radiation or the immune system or carbon dioxide or foods or drugs, kidney stones yet because we don't have time. I can do it in another video, you know, space medicine for not quite beginners. If you want it, I will do it. But what does this all mean? It basically paints the picture of an astronaut who arrives on Mars, immediately gets dizzy, falls down the ladder, breaks his leg, can't lift himself up, goes blind, doesn't know what time of day it is, and is deeply suicidal or just plain nuts. That is not the kind of caliber of person we want to be taking to Mars. So this begs the question, what the hell do we do about this? So what are countermeasures? Well, they're what happens to you when you like and subscribe to this channel. Also, they are things we can do to try and stop all that crap happening to you in the first place when you're up there. A simple thing is like taking a seasickness tablet when you get to space. So space sickness, take seasickness tablets, and they do that, and it works. Countermeasure approved. Let's look at some other things, and we'll start with your diet. So on Earth, you might eat something like this. Got some fruit, some veg, some meat, some bones. First up, you need to drink more. Now, astronauts probably don't drink enough. They're just like cats. And like cats, they get dehydrated, they get kidney stones, and they can scratch each other if you leave them alone for too long. You drink less because of the stress of being up there, because of a chock-a-block schedule, and because of that fluid shift we were talking about earlier, where all the fluid ends up here, that makes your body think that you're well hydrated when you're actually not. So first up, drink more water than your thirst dictates, probably about two liters a day. And if you do a spacewalk, you're gonna need even more. Now onto food. If you're on a diet, space is pretty good because you tend not to eat nearly as much as you need to. And you can buy my book about space diets at all reputable dealers now, only 29.99. In space, astronauts also tend to crave more salt than they do on Earth, more sodium and less potassium. Your body adjusts along the way, but one of the problem of too much salt is that it can make your bones weaker. So we have to do something doubly special about that later on. Now, onto calcium, a really important mineral, and you're losing calcium because it's stored in your bones and you're losing your bones. Now, the way to counteract this probably isn't with milk, it's with vitamin D, which causes you to absorb more calcium. Now, we get a lot of vitamin D on Earth from the sun, but if you sunbathe in space, you'll burn your face off. So instead, we give them a simple vitamin D supplement. Easy. Mm.
So in space, you need to be super, super fit. Now we're not talking about any of that 10,000 steps a day rubbish. We're talking about being really fit, doing two and a half hours of exercise, six days a week. Now, even doing all that, astronauts' bones and muscles, they still waste away. And when your bones waste away, not only does that make you weak, but also it causes things like kidney stones as well. Whew. So what do we do about it? Well, we do three things. The first is lifting weights. But Dan, you say, you can't lift weight in space. There is no weight in space. And well, astronauts do do things like bench presses and deadlifts. How do they do that? Well, write your answers down on a piece of paper. We're going to come back to it in a few minutes. The second thing is taking drugs, which is especially useful for bones, given that we already give people drugs on Earth for osteoporosis. These are called bisphosphonates. They're being studied at the moment, and they look like they probably work. Then you get on a treadmill, and not just any old treadmill, because any old treadmill, you'd vibrate your space station off orbit, and you'd push yourself into the ceiling with one heel kick. So NASA have developed a super cool treadmill. It's called the Colbert, or the Colbert, which is an acronym for something even more ridiculous than SHIELD. It's got special shock absorbers in it to stop it shaking, and you get tied to it with bungees, which basically makes it feel like you're running with a heavy backpack. I did it once and I was knackered after literally one minute. Now, back to weightlifting. What did you think? Springs? Elastic bands? No and no. They actually suck a vacuum. This is amazing, and it's called the A-RED. And believe me when I say, it feels exactly like the real thing, which is pretty damn cool. Your surroundings make all the difference. Just ask this guy, and ask this guy. So up there, it makes sense to manipulate your environment to be just right. This is everything from getting the right temperature to moving the air around so you don't get carbon dioxide breathing out and pooling in front of your face and killing you, and to cool lighting, which simulates day and night on Earth, solving that circadian rhythm issue. And what about mental health? That's easy. Don't pick a nutcase to go to space. In seriousness though, a lot of it is due to selection. Do you have the right unagi to go to space? Think about it. Could you be in the same small flat with the same five people for months on end, not able to get away, not able to take a breather? So mindset is key. Of course, we can help astronauts out. I mean, they were doing Zoom calls way before COVID made it trendy. And what about that view? But what's the panacea, the silver bullet to fix all or almost all of the issues? Well, almost every problem we've run into is because there's no gravity. So the solution is artificial gravity. Is this science fiction? Well, it is if you want to do it like Star Trek, but you can do it in other ways too. You could do it with linear acceleration, so essentially getting faster and faster, like being on a plane that's taking off and pushing you as your seat accelerates. The problem is that you need to keep going faster and faster and faster, and then to stop, spin around, which would squish you like a fly on a windscreen. So you need to flip around slow and then decelerate at the same speed that you accelerated. Logistically, it's going to take bloody ages and probably doesn't make sense for human spaceflight. Magnets on your shoes? Nah, that's not real gravity. That just sucks you to the floor and probably shakes your ship off orbit and into the sun. A centrifuge? Well, yeah, we already know that works and we've even done small versions of it up there. There are a couple of problems to get around though. The first is that if you want to simulate 1G, that's the gravity on Earth, you need to either build something 1.8 kilometers long that rotates once per minute, engineeringly pretty difficult, or you build something that's about 10 meters in diameter but spills 100 times a minute, so like being in a washing machine, and that probably isn't going to be very fun for anyone either. So maybe there's a middle ground, and maybe you don't need 1G. Maybe you just need a bit of exposure in a bit of gravity for just a bit of the day. All things which we're currently working on and researching. The other issue is something called the Coriolis effect. I mentioned earlier that you have these semicircular canals in your ears and they're all at different planes. So if you get into a rotating drum and you're walking dead straight, great, no issue. But if you turn and walk to the side, suddenly the canal that was looking this way starts to be pushed that way and well, it makes you mega dizzy. I know that's probably difficult to understand, so you can try it yourself. Get on a spinny chair, now keep your head straight, shut your eyes, and get someone to spin you around for 10 seconds. Stop, open your eyes. Feeling dizzy? Of course you are. And that's messing with one of your semicircular canals. Now do it again, but this time shut your eyes and put your ear to your shoulder. 
Now, you done that? Yeah, you like that? That's what would happen if you turned around in a spinning drum. But we might be able to sort that problem out in the near future by basically switching off those affected nerves. So there you go, that's space medicine. We need to get you healthy enough to go to space, keep you healthy when you're up there, and then sort out the issues when you come back. We didn't really talk about the last one, but I'm sure you can figure some of it out. And where does this all lead? It leads to space travel, and I mean deep space travel, away from the orbit of Earth. Some people want to go to the moon, some want to go to Mars, and what about space tourism? One of the biggest dilemmas coming our way is that everyone that's been to space has been super fit and healthy so far. But what happens when the average person starts traveling? And believe me, they will. Obese people, diabetics, pregnant women, elderly, kids. Personally, I don't think this is a problem. I think this is exciting and it's going to blow the whole field wide open as we have to figure out how to tackle all these new challenges. There has never been a better time to get into space medicine. Take care and I'll see you up there. So click, 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 click everything. Thanks for watching. Feel free to leave some comments and let me know if you want to see any other videos or check out all of that over there. Bye bye.